All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Dana, for that generous uh, introduction. I'll try to, my best to live up to it. I'm not going to play any soccer or violin up here, but I'll uh, try to tell you about, about robots and robots that play soccer. In fact, I know many of you are here because uh, I put robots playing soccer in the title. Um, and that's fine. I'll show you, I promise I will, I, I'll show you lots of videos of, of robots playing soccer. But my goal for tonight, and I hope your goal as well, um, is for you to learn a little bit about the kind of research we do in the field of artificial intelligence, which is a sub-discipline of computer science. And, um, and so I'm, I'm going to, you know, there'll be some, some parts that are fun watching the videos and some that I'm going to um, get a, tell, tell you a little bit about how we make those things happen. So, is this, uh, okay, we're doing it on this one. So, um, there's a lot of goals of artificial intelligence. Um, some people study it to try to learn how, how the, the human brain works um, and then cross disciplines with, with psychology and neuroscience and things. Um, but one of the reasons uh, I work on, on artificial intelligence, one of the goals for me and some of the colleagues like me is to try to create what you would call an intelligent agent, a fully autonomous agent um, in the real world. So what exactly is an, an agent? What do we mean when we say that? Well, we mean something that um, has to sense it's the environment, that has to decide what actions to take in the environment, and then to actually execute them in the environment. So a robot is, is an example of that. An example of something that I don't usually call an agent is, is the, the Deep Blue, the, the chess playing program that, that beat um, or that, that uh, played against Garry Kasparov because it, it had to do the decision making, but it didn't have to do the sensing and it didn't have to do the acting. So I'm going to be telling you about, um, about autonomous agents and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go about doing that and in the, in the process hopefully tell you why I think it's an interesting thing to spend time thinking about soccer playing robots and autonomous cars and the problems that it forces us to confront in artificial intelligence. So, I keep showing that and then backing off, but because uh, I want to, I, I want to set up the the, um, the, the question. If if you had to, to build a an autonomous agent, a, a, a soccer playing robot, how might you go about doing it? Well, so the way people have started in the past, um, in sort of the traditional way, is to to think about breaking down the components and let's do each part individually. Let's think about how to make a good vision system that can see the world and see where the ball is, and a good walking system that can, that can walk. And people have, you know, it, it, that's one way to do it, is to break down the problem into lots of different parts. And, uh, and you need to do that. You need to make progress on all the sort of starting points. But I think it's also important, especially once you get the, the, the field gets to a certain point, to start trying to build complete solutions. And so the, one of the philosophies behind my research is that the way to try to accomplish this goal, the, the way towards this goal, is to try to build complete solutions to relevant challenge tasks. And so I'm going to argue that, that robot soccer is a good challenge task and that it's going to make some, uh, help us make progress towards this, this uh, ultimate goal. So I said that an agent is something that has to sense, decide, and act. It's sort of a closed loop. You should think of it as being something that, that works without a person involved. So you might have seen some um, robots where you can remote control them, where you can tell them where to go. Um, but what I'm interested in and what we're interested in artificial intelligence is robots that decide for themselves, sense by themselves, and take actions by themselves. And so we call that a closed loop. It's sort of they take the action and that affects what they sense again in the future. And by challenge task, I mean something where there's, there's a concrete objective. So don't just try to build a robot that doesn't... Uh, you know, that doesn't break or that doesn't fall off the cliff. You want to build one that actually is trying to accomplish something. And, um, and I think this can drive research in, in computer science, and in particular in the two areas of, of artificial intelligence that I focus most on. I, I feel strongly that if we have a comp a autonomous agents in the real world, that they better not make the same mistakes over and over again. If you had an autonomous car and it drove through the same pothole on the way to work every day, you'd, you'd start thinking this isn't really that intelligent. And so the field of machine learning is, is about trying to help agents improve from experience. And I'll, I'll spend some of the talk today telling you how we make that happen. 
The other thing that I really think is important if we're going to have these fully autonomous agents is that they need to be able to interact with one another. If I have an autonomous car and I'm living next to you, you're not going to say, oh, that's fine, he, need, he, he can have one, you, I don't want one. Everybody's going to have them, and then they're going to be out on the road together, and they're going to be interacting. They're going to have to not crash into each other, and, and how, how can we make that happen? And that's the area in, in artificial intelligence called multi-agent systems. And I'll spend sort of the second part of the talk telling you a little bit about um, how we make that happen. So, so really what you're going to get from here is sort of an insight into one particular approach, and it's definitely not the only approach. There's other people in artificial intelligence, colleagues who work with, from a completely different angle with a different philosophy. But I can describe this approach that I'm talking about here as a top-down empirical approach. Um, that really, uh, the slogan, you could say, is that good problems produce good science. And so I'm gonna, I, I think the problems I'm going to tell you about are some such problems. Now, this all, having good problems produce good science doesn't only happen in computer science. This has happened in many areas of, of science as well. So, for instance, um, the Wright brothers, they, had, they took on the problem of, can we get people to fly? And to do that, they had to discover new scientific principles. The Bernoulli principle was known uh, for water, but it wasn't known for air at the time. They had to, to figure that out to make this, to make this happen. The Apollo mission, the goal of landing a man on the moon, in some sense, you know, who cares if a man's walking on the moon? On the other hand, to make this happen, think of all the things that we have to accomplish. Things like remote body, body monitoring, telemetry. These are th contributions to science that came from this challenge test. The Manhattan Project, which had arguably both positive and negative effects, certainly um, in, in made contributions to science, for instance, in high-speed scientific computing and things like that. So what I'm going to tell you about now at the beginning of the talk is a challenge problem that unlike these ones is still in progress. All of these you know about in some sense because they successfully reached their completion. I'm involved in a challenge problem like these that for computer science that's only been going on for about 15 years or so and that we have a much longer horizon on and that's RoboCup Soccer. And in, in RoboCup Soccer, Robot Soccer, we have a goal and it's, you know, it's, it's good to have ambitious goals. Our goal is by the year 2050, to create a team of humanoid robots that can beat the human World Cup champion team. I mean on a real soccer field, outside, playing against them. I say 2050, you know, it, one lesson you learn when you're in artificial intelligence, never make predictions about what's going to happen before you retire. Because you're always wrong. But, you know, I, I, hopefully I'll be safe about this one. So, you know, this, this, can, this can keep me going throughout my career. So let me... I'll, um, I'll dive in and tell you why this is, it is still in its, its early stages. But it's a good challenge problem because, um, first of all, it allows for some incremental challenges where you have a closed loop, the thing I talked about, where you have to, the robots have to sense the environment, decide what to do, and act. And you can, you can study that already without being with humanoid robots on a real soccer field outside. We can do that in sort of smaller, incremental sub-challenges where we're first using wheeled robots inside, that are color coded with, with um, on like a you know, ping pong table and stuff like that. And we can gradually make the problem harder, but always keep this closed loop. It's also relatively easy for people to, to get involved in it. Some of you in your robotics classes in school may have already started trying to build robots that, you can, uh, that can play soccer, remote control or something like that. You can get involved in this without, you know, from, at an early stage. You can start thinking about multi-agent systems, which is what I told you is one of the areas that I'm interested in. Uh, and it's also very inspiring. It's just fun, right? It's fun to sit there in the lab or in front of the computer trying to make the robots um, get better at playing soccer. And my, you know, my, my graduate students, the people who work, who work on this are mainly um, people who are uh, working towards their PhD or their under, some undergraduate students, but mostly graduate students who have done really well in school in their math and science classes. Um, and they just, you know, when it comes, a competition is coming, they just, they work there all night. I don't have to ask them, can you, you know, work on the problem some more. They just, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So, and, but the most important thing is that there's visible progress. So, I'm going to show you two videos in a second that show you what RoboCup looked like at the early stages in the beginning and what it looks like now. First, I'm just going to introduce you a little bit. There's, a, there's several different leagues in RoboCup. They each have different properties um, that, that uh, allow you to study different, different um, challenges, different scientific challenges. There's some 
that are uh, the small sized robot league have sort of Rubik's Cube sized robots um, and an overhead camera. And then there's the middle sized robots that are more like trash can sized robots. The standard platform league, everybody has the same robot. So in these ones, you have to build your own robots. There's electrical and mechanical engineering challenges involved. As a computer science scientist, I focus more on the uh, standard platform league where everybody has the same robots or the simulation league where, it's, where, it's, uh, where you work in simulation. It's, it's, these are much more about programming. And there's also now work in the humanoid league. So let me just show you. At the beginning, back in the first years, 97 and 98, this is actually very painful for me to watch right now. But at the time, you have to understand, this was a huge accomplishment to have in a room lots of different robots all working. Okay, so yes, they crashed into walls sometimes, and, and yes, the, the goalies didn't always do very much. I think you're going to see up here, uh, you know, the goalie just sort of, you know, there is no goalie, it's just sort of stepped aside. Um, but, but the fact that these robots were seeing, they were, they were recognizing the ball with a camera, deciding what to do, and acting. There were about 30 or 40 robots in a room together back in 1997. That was a huge accomplishment. Now, um, but, you know, of course, we wouldn't be satisfied if it stopped there. And looks like I have to... Um, so this is about, you know, 10 years, uh, about 10 years later, you can see some of the same leagues. Um, and this should look noticeably different to you. You'll see the robots moving individually a lot more quickly. Um, but there's, you know, there's also passes, and, there's, and uh, here the, in the small size league now, the ball sometimes goes up in the air. These, uh, these eyebos are um, kicking into the, into the goal, and then there's a, you'll see a pass about to happen in the middle-sized league. Um, the humanoid league was just starting. The, the humanoid league was just starting back then, so it doesn't look as good, but by now, actually, four, four years later, you start to see games that look really like soccer there. So, and I have to emphasize, these are not all... The robots I showed you here are not all my robots. These are robots from, that have been developed by people around the world, other professors, other graduate students who come together every year at, a, at an international competition and put the robots down. And the thing that's in common here is when they're playing, there's no person in the loop. So we, we you know, program them ahead of time, but once the whistle blows, we're all just standing there cheering them on. We can't, we can't type anything. We can't... Uh, there, there was a rumor one year that, that there was a team that was clapping in patterns that was controlling the robots. But that was unsubstantiated. Um, so, so this is, you know, we, you can see the progress. In fact, every year I go, I'm always surprised. In one of these leagues, at least, there's a quantum jump in the level of performance. And we, get, we had the competition in Singapore this past year. We'll be going to Istanbul this coming year. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, it, it really is pushing science. And there's been advances in lots of different areas, lots of different publications in some of the top uh, journals and uh, conferences in computer science, including PhD theses. One of those PhD theses, I think, was one of the, the first that was driven by robot soccer was my own. I was very lucky to sort of get in on this at the, at the ground level. And without going into too much detail about it, the, the thing that I noticed is that if you want to get robots to play soccer, you can't program them exactly what to do at every given situation. There's just too many combinations of where the ball could be and where the other robots could be. So there's going to have to be some kind of learning, some kind of generalization, some kind of figuring out what to do from examples. But it's just too big a task to say, try random things and see what works. It's just, you know, instead, there was a team that tried doing that, but mainly the robots learned to spin in circles. They didn't really get very far. So what, we, what, I, what I observed is that you could break down a task into different subtasks and use learning at each of those different levels. So you could learn, the, the robots could sense from the environment what the world state is and use that to learn individual behaviors, like how do you kick the ball and how do you intercept the ball, and then use those to learn more multi-agent behaviors, like how to pass or where to pass, and then more team behaviors and all the way up to how do you beat the opponents. And we use machine learning at various different levels. In fact. Um, in, my, in my thesis, we, I used a, a neural network, which is a machine learning algorithm, for robots to learn how to intercept the ball in simulation. So we would just send the ball towards them and let them practice. Should you move right? Should you move left? What works best? And then used a decision tree, which is another standard machine learning method, to, um, to learn what's the likelihood that a pass will succeed if you send the ball to somebody. All the way up to finally the team, which entered the RoboCup competition. Um, and it, um, 
I'll show you what this looked like. This was, to do this, we had to use a new machine. We had to develop a new machine learning algorithm to decide where to pass. It was a, a type of reinforcement learning algorithm. And what I'm going to show you is a clip from the finals of the 1999 simulation competition. My team here in the finals was in red, and it was using the, this learned approach. And just to orient you a little bit, the, the ball's in the middle, the goals are on either side, you have the goalies. And you have to remember here, it's not like a video game where there's one program controlling all the players. In the simulation leagues in RoboCup, there's a separate program controlling each of these players, and that's why they have to figure out how they can, how they can work together as a team. So I'm going to play this in slightly faster than, than real time, but what you should notice is that the players are are working it out. They're not all just grouping around by the ball. When the ball goes out of bounds here, we actually had a, a multi-step plan where they know what to expect in advance, sort of a set play that they all know to expect because they've been, they've, uh, been programmed for their different roles. You'll see that that one didn't quite work, but you'll see them try it again, and this time it will. Um, and in this, in this competition, over the course of eight games, um, the red, my team uh, scored 110 goals and didn't give up any. So it won the competition. And, um, and you can see that you know, it was able to do things like get open, move to where, when you don't have the ball. So people always think that the hardest thing to do is what, what do you do when you have the ball. But actually, some of the most important is what you do when you don't have the ball. How do you space yourself? And that's what they're doing. They're talking with each other. Um, but this also illustrates some of the progress that's happened in RoboCup because the next year, we entered exactly the same team, and it finished in fourth place. And that, so that was 2000. And by now, all the teams in the competition can, can blow this team out out of the water. So that's another way that we can measure the progress that's happening. Um, we then took this and applied the idea of layered learning to real robots. And so these are those, those IBOs that I told you about. We had those here at UT Austin and in the lab. One of my students, Nate Cole, said, well, you know, we're spending all this time trying to get them to walk. Can't we let them learn how to walk? So that's what they're doing here. These robots are practicing walking back and forth Know, they know how far the field is across. Um, and so they're just experimenting. What happens if I spread my legs out a little more? What happens if I move them a little quicker? And they're talking with each other about what's worked and what hasn't worked. And by doing this, we ended up with a walk that was 20% was faster than we were able to generate by hand coding. And it was the fastest walk using these robots at the time in the, in the world. And so and everybody else was sitting there trying to say, well, I'm going to move the, the joint to this angle and then that angle. And we just said, let's let the robots figure it out. On the right here, you have it figuring out how to control the ball under its chin, the same idea. It's practicing. It's trying to figure out when should it put its, its, put its head down, when should it, when should it walk, when, when should it slow down. And it's getting better as it goes at, at capturing the ball so it can control it. And the thing to remember here, people say, you know, can robots learn, can computers learn? These robots are learning, but it's not magic, right? They're not just, you know, we don't just put them on the field and say learn. We have to write a program, and there's a well-defined algorithm inside that tells them what do you do when something works well, what do you do when something doesn't work well. And that's where, the, that's where we have to spend our effort, is developing these algorithms. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, as the talk goes on. Now... One of the important things, in, in addition to walking and controlling a ball, if you're going to, to play um, robot soccer, is vision. And so um, I told you about my thesis on layered learning, which was focused on the decision making. There is recently uh, somebody graduated from this university, from UT Austin. His name is Mohan Sridharan. He's now a professor at Texas Tech. And he focused on robot vision as his PhD thesis and used RoboCup as the inspiration, although he worked in other domains as well. The reason that computer vision is difficult, or robot vision is difficult, first of all, there's been a lot of progress in computer vision. People, you know, people are, it's one of the big problems in computer science right now still, but there's been a lot of progress in shape modeling, object recognition, face detection, things like that. But on a robot, there's some things that, that are more difficult than just having a stationary camera. The camera's moving around, the robot is, has limited computation on board, um, and you have to deal with sort of changing colors and to get a sense of that, this is what the world looks like through the camera of one of those robots. Okay, so this is a robot, the eyeball robot, walking up to the ball and trying to score the goal. This is the input to our computer program. So we need to write a program that takes not really these pictures, but actually the pixels of this picture. So if you've ever opened up your digital, if you ever opened a file from your digital camera, you know that 
that the way a single image is represented like this is just an array of pixels. There's a dot up here, and there's a number between 0 and 255 for how red it is, another one for how green, and for another for how blue. There's a bunch of those numbers, just thousands of numbers. And we get one of those big images 30 times a second. And we need to write a program that takes that as input and as output tells the robot how to move its joints. That's the robot soccer problem. That's the challenge of programming a robot to play, to play soccer. And so just focusing on the vision part leads us to a lot of, um, a lot of research challenges. And in fact, I told you about um, Mohan Sridharan. He worked on this autonomous color learning. Rather than, again, having, going in and telling the robot what's green and what's yellow and what's orange, he, he figured out a way to have it learn that um, by experience. And so this is, this is the output of, of, the, of his vision processing. It, you can see that you're seeing the whole picture, but he's detecting here where the ball is, where the goal is, where the lines and where the beacons are. And then that can be used to help the robot figure out what it should do at any given time. Now what I want to do is to, at this point is show you, um, once you put this all together, Fox Sports World put together a really nice um, compendium that took some artistic liberties. liberties. So robot competitions don't look like this or sound like this. Um, Welcome to the first ever world championships. But they did a really good job of this, so I have to show you. Um, we only sent them our footage. So, um, so these are, all the goals are goals that we scored, and all the saves are saves that we scored, or we saved. But here you can see what one of these competitions looks like um, without the fans. But, um, but you see that these robots have to be doing that vision problem that I told you about 30 times a second on a computer that's on the robot and still have processing power left over to decide what to do. In fact, here it bumps into the other robot and it still knows where it is and it kicks sideways. Right? That's the localization problem. How does it decide to know... How does it know which way it's facing on the field? Um, so you'll see here, uh, this will be a save by our goalie. So this was our goalie. Um, very stylish, I thought. And, uh, and my, my, my favorite goal is the one that's coming up here. Because watch this robot. It's able to... to pinch the ball under its chin like we had it learn to do, turn around that robot, and then use its vision to find the open part of the goal and shoot away from the goalie. And so, um, this is, and all of this is happening, the, the processor on this robot is about 500 megahertz. It's like a little laptop with legs. I'll show you at the end of the talk, all these videos, by the way, are on my website, and you can, you can find them afterwards. Those, so we used to use the, the Ibo robots. Sony doesn't, doesn't make those anymore. I told you what we, did, we do is we program. Uh, we, we don't build the robots in my lab. We mainly focus on programming them. So we're now using humanoid robots. And this is a clip from the, um, from the competition just this last year. We, um, we won the U.S. Open this year, and we finished third in the International Robo Cup out of 24 teams. So this is our team in blue playing against a, another team. Um, at RoboCup, I'm sorry about the shaky camera work, but, um, but this shows you sort of what the, what the RoboCup looks like these days. And luckily, the goalie got up and got out of the way here, but you see that... So these are, these are the robots we, we use right now. Those are the robots we use in, our, in the competitions. And this, this has the same problem as the IBOs. They, they actually look not quite as good because they're moving more slowly, but there's, the cameras are even bigger and better, so there's more processing we have to do. And of course, the problem of walking on two legs is a lot harder than the problem of walking on four. <coughs> so that's more or less um, what I wanted to say about robot soccer. There's, um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the simulation in a little while. But soccer, is, is, you know, I said the reason I do it, work on it, is because it's a great challenge problem. But there's many other great challenge problems in artificial intelligence as well. And these are all ones that, that I've worked on either in the past or work on now in, in my lab. And uh, so you can, you can think of trying to build agents that bid in auctions, trading agents, um, like on eBay, bid, bidding for different goods. 
uh, autonomic computing, which would be computer systems that can diagnose their failures or when they're getting, you know, when there's something wrong and try to fix it. If there's like a computer down, try to reroute uh, packets around the network. Socially assistive robots. There's actually a part of RoboCup. I've been telling you about RoboCup that's the um, RoboCup soccer, but there's also a RoboCup at home competition, which is uh, domestic robots that, that have to um, work in sort of living room environments and, and home environments. This year, one of the tasks was going to a real Toys R Us store and going down the aisles to try to locate a particular item and bring it back to the checkout counter. Um, and we participated in, we finished second place in the RoboCup at Home competition in 2007. Um, but I'm all, another great one is autonomous vehicles. And, um, and that's, I'm going to show you some, uh, some of the, the work that we've been doing in autonomous vehicles as well um, later, in, later in the talk. But one thing, if, for those of you who are perceptive, um, well, I should say, all of these challenge problems, the reason I find them interesting is because they influence or they, they motivate research in many, many different areas of artificial intelligence, like game theory or vision or multi-agent reasoning or learning. Some of these I've spoken to you about and some of them I haven't as much. But if those of you who are particularly perceptive will notice that these all um, are pointing towards the, my two favorite areas, machine learning and multi-agent systems. So I'm going to now... Um, you know, I, I've sort of hooked you in with some fun videos and things. I'm now going to spend a little bit of time telling you how our agents do this machine learning. And uh, so it might get a little bit more um, technical for a little while, and then I'll jump back up and show some more fun videos. Um, but machine learning is the, the study of, of try, as I said before, trying to get computers to improve their performance over time. And, it's really been with us since the beginning. Artificial intelligence has only been around from the, since the 50s or so. Um, and even by the 80s, there were people, big names in the field, saying now there's a resurgence of machine learning, which means that there'd been enough time for it to sort of be there, then go away and come back. Machine learning's always been really a, a, a deep um, part of, of, why people, of, of what people try to get computers to do when they call things intelligent. Now, there is a, a type of machine learning called supervised learning that's fairly, a fairly mature area. There's still a lot of research going on in it, but um, when I say it's fairly mature, there's, there's off-the-shelf software you can get that's, that's open source. There's a package, for instance, called Weka. You can go, and you don't need to, be a, um, to have a PhD in computer science to be able to, use, to do supervised learning. You can go and, and learn about and you know, get the software and try to, try to use it. And, I, you know, people who are interested, I encourage you to go and, and look for the Weka package and play with it a little bit. Um, but a supervised learning problem is one where you have some labeled examples. So, for instance, in handwriting recognition, you might see this picture and have somebody tell you that's a four, and that's a three, and that's a one, and you get lots and lots of those examples, and then you have to say, what's this? Okay? And you know it's an eight, um, but, you know, how does the computer know that? Um, it has to do that by learning, by, by generalizing from the examples that it has. It will have never, it can't just look up, it'll never have seen exactly these pen strokes before. It's gonna, but it will have seen a bunch of examples of eights, and it's gonna have to, to learn to generalize that this is closer to the pen strokes that we've labeled eight than to the ones that we've labeled three, for instance. And so there are, um, I'm not gonna go into the details of the algorithms, but there's, there, there's ways, of, ways of doing that. Now, for autonomous agents, for the things I've been telling you about, there's another kind of machine learning that's actually sort of more appropriate, rather than this sort of labeled example, because it's hard to get these examples. So, you know, if, if a robot's learning to play soccer, it's hard to, to, every second, tell it, that's what you should do, that's what you should do, and give it, like, a whole bunch of, of labels of, from this situation, the right thing to do. What's much easier is to just let it practice, to, to play in the world by itself, to get experiences, and that, doing that is called reinforcement learning. Um, and so the basic way that an agent does reinforcement learning is that there's, the agent is living in this, side of, in this box and it has a current policy, a current mapping from states to actions. So what that means is it just can look up what's the state of the world right now, where are all the other players, and what does my policy tell me to do? What action should I take? And then it can take that action by executing it, and then that affects the environment, what next state it's in. If I decided to pass the ball over there, then in the next state, the ball's going to be over there, right? Or if I decided to pass it over there, it's going to be over there. So the agent just keeps taking actions, and every once in a while, it might get a reward. Like if, the goal, if a goal is scored, 
we can say that was a good, good action. You just got a plus. You just got a plus one or a plus 100 or whatever. The thing is, what gave it that plus 100 is not just the last action it took. It's all the, the long sequence of actions that led you up to the point where you could take the action that gave you the reward. And so reinforcement learning is about how can you figure out what are the right actions, even though the reward doesn't happen, there's not this label after every single action. You have delayed reward. And this is a really exciting area. In fact, there's some very beautiful theoretical proofs um, about some, some very, actually, fundamentally quite simple algorithms. Um, but the challenge is how can we make these apply in real-world domains? So one of these algorithms is that, that's sort of a very successful, um, the, from a theoretical perspective, is called Q-learning. And the, the proof that came in 1989 and actually really exploded the field. After this, uh, this happened, lots and lots of people started becoming interested in the, the topic of reinforcement learning. Is a guy named Chris Watkins proved that a simple algorithm called Q-learning converges to pi star, which is the way we say the optimal policy. It actually, if you let the agent practice enough, it will be guaranteed to find the best possible policy, the best possible actions. Not just a local optimum, for those of you who know what that means, actually the globally optimal policy. And it does that in a very simple way. It uses an intermediate data structure called a Q function that's a mapping from all the possible states in the world to all the possible actions in the world. And, and it just says how, if you're in this state and you take this action, how much future reward will you get if you keep executing your policy over and over? And so what this, you know, if you have that, that Q function or that value function, then it's trivial to decide what action to take. From any state, you just look at the action that will give you the highest value from that point, and you take that action. So the key is, how do you learn that value function? And Q learning does it in a very simple way. It just takes a state the last state, the action, the next state you get into, and the reward you saw, and it makes just a small little update to this reward function. But it does that every single time you get a new experience. Now, oops, um, this is great in theory, and the proof really is beautiful. But the problem is that you have to be able to visit every single state infinitely often before you can be guaranteed to find the, 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 um, the optimal policy. And in soccer, you can't even visit every state once. There's so many possibilities of where all the players are and where the ball is. So you have to do something more than just storing every state action pair. Even so, it, so, so a lot of people spend time on trying to, um, to make this scale up. And there's, I'm not going to go into the details on how this can be done. One of the ways, is, though, is rather than thinking about every state individually, to generalize over those states, to think of them as being somewhat different. Um, I mean, sorry, so somewhat similar, the neighboring states. And um, I, I, th I can't remember if I have a slide on that after this. But, but what I will tell you about is there have been some great success stories using um, scaling up reinforcement learning to, uh, to hard problems. Jerry Tassaro, back in 94, he's a researcher at IBM, created a program that was competitive with the best human backgammon playing program or best human backgammon players, his program could um, play as well as them, and it just learned by playing against itself over and over again for a long time, by just and improving over time, using exactly the algorithm I told you about, Q-learning. There's also some very impressive work by a colleague, Andrew Eng, who used reinforcement learning to um, learn how to control a helicopter. From a person would just remote control the helicopter for about five minutes to allow the helicopter to learn what happens when you take an action. And then he got this helicopter to figure out how to spin in a circle upside down, which is actually, I don't know how to fly a helicopter, but I'm told that's one of the hardest things to do with a helicopter. And this was done also using, um, using reinforcement learning. Now, I can't stop talking about soccer, so I'm also going to tell you about how we've studied, with a colleague of mine, Rich Sutton, um, we studied uh, how to get soccer players to learn to improve their performance, not in the whole game, because that was, that was too big a problem, but in a smaller game called Keep Away. Um, and if those of you who play soccer have probably played this on, the, on the, the soccer pitch as well, where you have some players that are the keepers that are trying to keep the ball away from a, a group that's the takers. And um, 
what that looks like. This is what I'm gonna, This is what it looks like before learning. Um, okay, wait, that didn't quite. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so so this is before learning. The yellow team is just trying to keep the ball away from the blue team. In this case, the blue team is just always going to the ball all the time because it turns out that one yellow player can keep the ball away from one blue player forever. So the two blue players have to go together. But before learning, they're not doing very well. But we were able to use a reinforcement learning algorithm um, using a, a, a method called function approximation. And this is actually what I was about to, I couldn't remember if I had a slide for this, but I do. I told you we can't learn for every given state. If you're trying to play keep away like that, there's just too many states out there. So instead, we generalize and so every time we see a state, we say, well, it's probably similar to all the other states out there. We don't represent it as a table anymore. We use a, a, a more a continuous function. And so every example we get teaches you about the value of a bunch of different states and actions that are nearby. Okay, now it's harder to prove that that's going to work, but the question is, does it work in practice? And the answer, um, using a particular type of, of algorithm, and the, the details of the, the jargon there is not important to understand, um, as much as to see the end result, we let them play overnight. We basically let them play for about 20 hours of just practicing. Um, and here's what, how good they were at keep away afterwards. And again, we didn't program them to tell them where should they kick the ball and when should they kick it. They just learned using reinforcement learning with this function approximation, with this generalization. And um, so these aren't real robots. This is just simulated. So they, they're moving this fast. That, that's, uh, that's actually a little faster than real time. But these, this graph shows you the, the hand-coded solution and the starting solution I showed you, and each of these green lines is a different learning curve. Over 20 hours or so, they all got up to holding the ball about two and a half times longer than they could before the learning happened. Okay, so and they did this again um, using reinforcement learning. I'm going to skip through a little bit of, of, um, of this. The, I guess, well, the, other, the, next, the, the last technical nugget I'll tell you about this is... So it's important to do this function approximation, Q-learning and sort of the most basic reinforcement learning algorithms. Every time you take an action, they learn a little bit from it, but then they throw the action away. And they say, okay, I'm going to try other actions and stuff. There are methods where we can actually save all of the past experience and remember it all and then make use of the, the data a lot more efficiency, <laughs> efficiently. So that takes more computation. It takes the computer has to think more about what the optimal action is but it makes it so you can learn in many fewer actions. And so we've also learned in that same keep away task, rather than doing the sort of online version here, which the red line would do, we can get to the same performance by saving all the experiences in just tens or hundreds of episodes. And so it'll only, it'll only take about you know, five to 10 minutes to learn instead of the 20 hours. And that's really important if you're gonna learn on a robot because you know, on, in a simulator, we can let it run overnight. But on a real robot, the, the motors start breaking down and, the, you know, wearing out. And, you know, a person has to be there watching them and stuff. So, so we're, we're, um, this, we were very excited about this. So really, this is the last I'm going to say about reinforcement learning. But it, this is a major area of research in my lab. And we're very focused on trying how can we squeeze the most out of the experience a robot has and the computation to make it learn as quickly as possible. And so there's other ways of doing that, and I promised Dana, who introduced me, that I would show him, that I would show you this, uh, this picture, or this video, that a student who's, who is a student of both of ours and worked in both of our labs, explored how we could use a human demonstra demonstration to speed up the learning. And, um, well, there's a video joke, or an audio joke in the, the, uh, the song here a little bit. And I'm not going to show you this whole video, but he took these robots, and said, what if he just puts himself in a, ca a motion capture suit, which is the, the uh, equipment in, in Dana's lab, and programs the robot to imitate him. So instead of us having the robot having to learn what to do, a person could say, here are the motions you should do by demonstration, and have the robot try to learn what to do from that. So for instance, here, a person is trying to control the robot as it's moving a car from this white box to that box. Um, and at first, the robot's not very good at it, um, but the person is standing behind and, and demonstrating with its arms what it should do. Um, and I think it gets better over time. Let me see if I can um, jump forward to the, the, 
Uh, this was another task, one that you had to pick up the blocks. Um, and again, the person is demonstrating how it should do this so it could learn. But my favorite one is this one, um, where the person's trying to teach the robot how to walk. It, now, we, if the person was on its hands and knees, the robot couldn't see, or we, the, um, the motion capture suit wasn't visible, so the person had to stay on his back and move the arms and legs. But we showed that people were able to, to teach the robots by doing this. Again, here it's a person showing a robot how to move its, move its hands. So that's one way to scale, scale up. I have another student who is focusing not on demonstration, but also people giving feedback. In the game of Tetris, this box up here shows when a person says that a move was good or bad. So when it's red, it says bad, and when it's green, it means good. And a person here is training, again, giving the, re the, the reward signal to that reinforcement learner. So again, we're, the agent's using reinforcement learning, but um, the, the reward signal is coming from a person. And so that's also helping us use the data. This is before learning, so it doesn't look very good. But after just two games of learning, we ended up with a policy that was much, much better. I'm not going to play this for very long, but for those of you who know Tetris, you know, the goal is to try to, um, to make full rows across the bottom. And this basically, it cleared hundreds of rows. And it, just from a, two games of a person demonstrating what's a good move and a bad move. Not, not, sorry, not demonstrating, but giving feedback. So in the first video I showed, it was a person demonstrating. Here it was a person giving the reward signal. So these are some of the ways that, um, that we can try to focus on helping a, 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 a machine learning program squeeze the most out of its data. Okay, now there's, I promised that in, in the title of the talk, I promised I would talk about robot soccer and autonomous cars going through intersections. And uh, so I just have a couple slides left, and we're going to focus on that, on autonomous cars. And in particular, what that tells us about multi-agent reasoning. So I said that um, in multi-agent, one of our goals is to create robust, fully autonomous agents. And I told you at the, at the beginning that once there's one, there's probably going to be many. Um, and they're gonna, once that happens, they're going to need to, um, to uh, coexist and interact. So one example is that uh, Dana said in the introduction about the, the, the autonomous driving competition that we participated in. There was actually one before I participated called the Grand Challenge. That was a great first step. Um, it was in 2005, a bunch of cars. This car has no person inside. They drove about 120 miles through the desert in about 10 hours. Um, and, uh, and this is a car from Carnegie Mellon. It was the second place finisher in the competition. It's going to about to cross the finish line. And this was a huge success of showing that cars could drive themselves, but it was, just, it was just individual cars. When one car was about to pass another one, they would pause the car in front and let the other one pass because they didn't want any collisions. So it was really just about, you know, could an individual car go through? So here you see it crossing the finish line. That was, it, that was a big landmark in autonomous driving. But the competition that we participated in back in 2007 with a lot of undergraduate students from the university here was the Urban Challenge. And here's our car. Um, as it's trying to, there's again, no person in the car, trying to um, take a left-hand turn to go through this crossroad here, and then it'll make another left-hand turn. And it completed this loop about eight times in 20 minutes. Um, the cars on the inside here, the inside lane, are all being driven by uh, professional drivers with crash helmets on. Um, they were a little bit nervous. But, but our robot did this successfully. So there you see it found a gap in traffic and made a left turn. It'll come up to this line, and it again looks for a gap in traffic to try to, to make the next left turn. And it's doing this. There's a, a, uh, it's got a laser, um, a laser range finder on top that's, uh, that's detecting where all of the, the other cars are. And it's got um, a very accurate uh, GPS system, so it knows exactly where it is in the, in the, um, in the road. Another test that, the robot, that we had the, the robot do, here you see a shot from inside the, ca the car as it's coming up to a four-way intersection. It needed to know the rules of the road, um, the California rules, rules of the road. So when it got there, it was supposed to wait for all the cars that were in front to go first, but this car back here gets to the intersection after our car, and so, um, so we have the right of way. So the car knew to, it's going to turn left once it's its turn. It has to wait between two and ten seconds, so it waits about five seconds. But we didn't even get to see this happen. This is a camera inside the car. We had to turn the car over to the race officials, and they just put in a little 
a memory stick that said what the mission for the car was, what points it had to get to, and then we started our camera and we had to just you know, wait to see what happened. And afterwards, we played the video back and saw that it, was, it did a, you know, made the right decision here. Um, and another one that we had to do was uh, the car was given the point that it had to get to as being right by this tree over here, but unbeknownst to us and unbeknownst to the car ahead of time, they blocked the road, they put in a barrier, and the car had to figure out what to do about this. Um, well, it stopped, and uh, it's not allowed to go off the road, so in the time you saw it stop there, when it detected it, it replanned and decided, okay, if I'm going to get to that point, I now have to go around the block. So it does a three-point turn, um, and there's algorithms in artificial intelligence for searching a graph for how do you get to, you know, from one point to another more efficient, most efficiently. There's a simple one called A-star search that, that this car was using here. So you see it, there was a jump ahead in the video there, but it got back to an intersection. It turns right, and then it's going to, uh, there'll be another skip to the next intersection, and eventually it's going to get to back to where it started. So there was the jump ahead. And you'll see after this next turn that it gets back to the, close to the, um, close to the starting point, and in fact, it's able to get, so here's the, the tree that I showed you at the beginning, here's that barrier from the other side, it gets to the, the point it needed to get to is right about here, so it stops, does another three-point turn, and then continues on its mission. So again, this is something we didn't get to see. Um, in fact, we were very confused about why the car, we saw the car like cross one way, and then all of a sudden it was going back the other way, and we didn't know why it had done that, but we got to see the camera afterwards, through the camera afterwards, why, why it had done that. So, so this is, autonomous cars are actually, we have this car now, it's at uh, Pickle Research Center and we, we still use it all the time for, uh, for education and research. But I had a student who, started, who thought, well, you know what, autonomous cars, this, this proves it, it's going to be possible. So once it happens, what can, you know, what, what's the future? What can we think about? What, what are the possibilities? And in particular, my student Kurt Dressner, who's now, he's now an employee at, uh, at Google, but he, he started, uh, yeah, Google's taking all, all the good students these days. But, um, he, uh, but he finished his PhD first on this topic, which was thinking about, um, could we do better than traffic signals and stop signs? And, you know, I could give a whole talk on this, but I'll just show you sort of the most um, uh, sort of demonstrative video of this, which is, in simulation, he created a system where these cars that are autonomous are able to call ahead for a reservation, so the, the cars that are white already have a reservation for exactly when they should go through the intersection. And the ones that are yellow don't yet. So this one's waiting to try to get a reservation. It's, call, it's calling ahead using wireless communication. And it gets that reservation and it has a guaranteed path through the intersection with, with no collisions. Now you should not, now remember, you're not driving the car, right? So don't think of yourself with your knuckles on the steering wheel and, you know, about to press the brake. You're in the back seat reading the newspaper with the windows dark. Right? You're not looking out the window. But now, uh, of course, this is for this is you know slightly for dramatic effect to to see them all going so close. In practice, we would have them spaced out a little bit further. Right? We could have the cars pretend they're bigger than they actually are. But at first, as Dana mentioned in the introduction, also um, I first gave this talk in India, where you know it actually wasn't that big of a jump. Um, the difference here is that. In this case, there are accidents, trust me, there's a lot of accidents. Whereas in our case, we can guarantee that if the cars are following the protocol that we designed, there won't be any accidents. Now, you might say, okay, okay, well that was in simulation. You know, it's easy to, to put something in simulation. What about in real cars? Um, if, I, you know, if I told you we have 100 autonomous cars and we have this system implemented, do you want to sit in one while we, while we test it, while we develop it? Probably you'd say no. Um, but we, we don't have 100 autonomous cars. Luckily, we do, though, have the one that I showed you. And so actually, just this weekend, this coming weekend, um, a postdoc from my lab, is, is, he's uh, just arrived at a, the, one of the main robotics conferences um, called IROS. It's in Taiwan this year. And he's going to be presenting a, a paper this weekend where we talk about how we can test this system with our real car, but in a safe way. We put together the simulation in our real car into this... A mixed reality simulation um, where if you were watching this from uh, outside you would say well the cars just went through an intersection and there's no other cars there why did it stop or sometimes it doesn't stop well we have um, this single car with a proxy vehicle in the simulator so there's actually a, you can't really see it here but there's a 
There's a car here that's at exactly the location that the real car is, and then there's a lot of simulated cars, and our car has to either get a reservation or not to go through the intersection. And here you see it going through the intersection just as it is in real life. This is a video from just up, up north at Pickle Research Center where we, where we did this, and, um, and so we call this the mixed reality system, and it's, and it's currently being used and developed, so we can actually... Um, demonstrate that this protocol is possible to use on a real car. Um, and as we, once we have it all worked out and make sure there's no collisions in simulation, if somebody gives us, uh, donates us 100 autonomous cars, then we'll make a real version of this. Um, so uh, I think we're, we're pretty much out of time. I want to leave time for questions and answers. I told you there's some other domains that we work on. One of them is autonomous bidding agents. I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, we continue to work on that, and there are some trading agent competitions as well. There's papers on our, on our website. Um, but before I close, there is one thing I want to talk about. Because, you know, as a scientist who's interested in re artificial intelligence and robotics, people always ask, you know, should we be scared? Are the robots going to take over the world? And, you know, it, it is a question we need to ask, right? If our goal is to create fully autonomous agents in the real world, we have to ask what happens when that happens occurs? Is it going to be sort of the Jetson-style utopia where, you know, all the cars do go through intersections and gas is saved and lives are saved and things like that? Um, you know, some people think that's what's happening. Hollywood has a different view. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of movies about the sort of doomsday scenarios. And, you know, we have to think about which is what, what, is, what is more likely. One way I like to think about that, and this is a question for you to go home and talk about with your, with your friends and, and, uh, and family, is, you know, is technology making the world a better place or is it making a wor the, the world a worse place in general? We all know that technologies have negative uses, right? That when people invent things, there are bad things that can happen if they're in the wrong hands. But there's also good uses. And so the question is, on balance, is the world getting better or worse as a, as a, um, due to technology? And one way to think about that is, would you rather live 100 years ago or would you rather live 100 years in the future? And, you know, I, I, as a, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if, if you know, I didn't, wouldn't instantly jump to the future. I'm very curious to see what the world's like. But there's a lot of compelling reasons that life was better in the past, and you can get into some very interesting discussions. The world is changing in many ways, in a lot of ways for, for the worse. But I, I believe strongly that, that, um, that AI can be a part of the solution much more than it is a part of the problem. I can't prove that. You need to make your own decision about that. And I really do encourage you to go and ask that question to lots of different people and see, see what kind of different answers you get. So uh, just in, in closing, in summary, um, the, uh, I talked to you about the goal of artificial intelligence being about trying to create robust, fully autonomous agents in the world. And I, and I argued to you that one way to do that is to build complete solutions to relevant challenge tasks like robot soccer and autonomous driving and others with the idea that good problems drive research. Um, and I hope I gave you at least a taste for some of the research issues, um, without going into too much detail, um, on the current challenges in machine learning and in multi-agent reasoning. If you do want to learn more about it, um, every year at, uh, there's an event on campus called Explore UT, which is the first Saturday of, of March. Um, and we open up the lab and we show live demos of robot soccer and we have the autonomous car on campus and show it driving by itself. So I encourage you to come and see those, those interactive demos. And there's also um, these, um, it, there's also on my webpage, you can go and uh, just, you know, if you search for me um, and you click on the research link, you, you can see a lot of the videos that I, um, that I showed tonight and many more, for those of you who want the details, there's a lot of papers listed here. Um, you can find the link, for instance, to the Autonomous Traffic Management uh, Project here. And if you click on the, the top talk here, there's a bunch of the videos that, uh, that I showed tonight. So with that, I, uh, I thank you all for your, for your attention and for coming. And I'll be very happy to take questions um, if there are any. Those questions for Peter. Go ahead. Go ahead and call him. Sure. So the question is. Uh, Excuse me. You guys have to be quiet and you have to be still, so we can hear the questions. Okay. Thank you. So the question was, how big are the programs involved? Um, 
They all they, they vary, of course, but uh, I actually asked about the autonomous intersection management simulator that we had. Um, I, we, we counted the lines recently there of code. It's written in Java, and there's right now about 40,000 lines of Java code. Um, but different, you know, the, the Tetris program is much smaller than that. The robot soccer ones are probably in the tens of thousands as well. Yeah. So the question is, how long did it take us to build the robots? So, we, as I said, we didn't actually build the robots ourselves. We programmed the robots. But it's taken a lot of time. It's, um, the first year, uh, it took us about four or five months when we first got the robots just to get them to, to be able to kick a ball the first time. But to get them to be good, it took us you know, about a year and a half or two years before they were able to walk fast. And then we just keep working on them. It's been, we've been working on them here for now. Uh, I've been here for eight years, so we've been working on them for about eight years, and it's, it's you know it's continuing to continuing to go. Yeah. So the question is, how do we interface with the the psychology department? So, um, well, first of all, there are several people in computer science who are also co uh, faculty in computer science. Dana is is one of them. There's a, something called the C Center for Perceptual Systems that focuses on both how computers can perceive the world and how people and the brain perceives the world. I, I, one thing that I, I have a direct collaboration with some colleagues in, in the psychology department on the Tetris playing program because a person there is giving the, the advice or the, the um, feedback to the person and so we have to ask how do people naturally train agents? How, do, how would people, um, if we build an agent that behaves one way, will people treat them in a different way? And so we've been running some human studies with our colleagues in the, in the uh, psychology department, changing the agent in different ways and seeing how people change their training, uh, training strategies. So that's just some of it, but there's, there's a lot of sort of, you know, the, the basic some of the basic questions are the same, which is, in our case, um, what is, uh, how do we create intelligent objects? And in psychology, it's how does the brain do the things that are, in, that are intelligent? We, I should look on the other side of the room a little bit. So, yeah. So the question was, why didn't we just put the se a sensor in the ball? We could do that, but we were interested in the, in, so we changed the problem every year to make it easier or harder. We wanted to do the, to work on the vision problem. Eventually, if we're going to play on a real soccer field against real people, there's not going to be a sensor in the ball. Now, we're still cheating a little bit because we're using an orange ball right now, which makes it a lot easier than having a black and white ball. Um, but eventually, we're going to need to, to change to a black and white ball. At first, there were walls around the field, and then we took those away. So we, every, you know, we try to keep the problem at a point where it's going to drive our research. And you know, if there were a sensor in the ball, we, pretty much, we, we know pretty much how we would handle that, and we want to focus more on the, on the vision problems. But that is something we could do. Um, there's a, you know, a group that has to decide what the rules are going to be, and then, there's, then we have to come and, and try, to, try to address them. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, are there fouls in soccer, robot soccer competitions? And there are. There's rules. The rules are sort of designed to, to try to have a trade-off between whether it's a, um, to making it a, a, a interesting competition to watch and also to, to drive the right um, issues. We don't want the robots slamming into each other and trying to break each other. So there certainly are, you know, when robots do that, a foul is called. Sometimes we have heated arguments about whether the robot did that intentionally or not. Um, <laughs> we try not to go there, but... Uh, but yes, there, there are rules at the competition that are, that are written, uh, written out and we have referees and um, it's, it's always very, very clear that, the, so for instance, one of the rules is that there shouldn't be more than one robot in the goalie box. You can't just line your robots up on defense, there has to be just one goalie. Um, and certainly when a robot runs into another robot, then it, it gets taken off as a penalty. So we try, to, we try to make sure that the robots do obstacle avoidance and, and obstacle detection. Yes, and the blue shirt in the back. Okay, so the question is, how many times have we won at RoboSoccer? I've told you that there's a lot of different leagues here. I was, I've been involved since the beginning. In 1997, um, I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University, and we won that year in the small size competition. In 1998, we won in the small size and the simulation. In 99, also in the simulation. Um, and then we've won a couple times in the coach competition, and we've won the last two years in the U.S. Open competition with these humanoid robots, with the NOWs. So... Um, I don't know. You're counting. Okay, seven, I guess. <laughs> Eight? Okay, thanks. Yes, in the black shirt. Yeah. 
So, um, I can't, percentage wise, I've had funding from private, private interests from, from like IBM has, has been a sponsor in the past. Um, General Motors with the autonomous car has been a sponsor in the past. A lot of my funding comes from the National Science Foundation, which is government, but it's you know, sort of basic science. And then we do have, have funding from, uh, from like Naval, Naval Research Institute and the Defense Department and things like that. Um, I don't, uh, none of the research that I'm doing is you know, sort of the, the, uh, the classified uh, side where there's the sort of basic research programs um, that, uh, that focus on sort of um, fundamental science and, and so those are the programs that, that we apply to. But uh, yeah, so it's sort of mixed across different government agencies and some, some private as well. Uh, I've had funding from NASA in the past as well, um, also government, but a different, you know, different flavor. So, um, yeah, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of different things. Okay, okay, just waving your hand. That's a good question. Are there other good sports for robots to play? In fact, we, we had to choose, you know, what, what sport would they play? We chose soccer. For, I was happy about the choice of soccer because I play soccer. That's my, what, what I like doing. But there are a number of reasons. First of all, you, could, you can play soccer in just two dimensions, right? If you're going to play baseball, a robot's going to have to deal with three dimensions, or volleyball or basketball. So um, soccer is sort of easier in that, in, in, um, in that vein. But there are people who have built, uh, I've seen a ping pong playing robot. Um, when we were in Pittsburgh, we took our robots, the small size robots, to a, to a Pittsburgh Penguins game, and they wanted us to dress them up as hockey players. It was, I guess there's not much difference between hockey and soccer when you put them on, you know, on these robots. So, so you could do robot hockey. Um, but uh, as many of the others, football and, 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 and such, there's different challenges. Um, and so I think really soccer is, is had sort of this uh, nice these nice properties that allowed us to start off um, easily and, um, and it also happens to be the most popular sport in the world so it's also, you know, as an international initiative was the, was the right thing to do. So maybe we'll see, we, you, know, I, you know, maybe we'll see robot football players in the future um, but I, th I think we're going to see uh, robots, soccer players against people before we say, see robot football players against people. Well, let's thank Peter for his excellent presentation.